at longer time of exposure. Similarly, if a person is barely ill or doesn't even have any symptoms, as turns out is the case with COVID-19 in some people, they may or may not be as infectious as someone who has a high fever and is coughing and sneezing and shivering and because they're maybe spreading the virus more because they have a higher viral load. Those are the concepts of how we spread infectious disease. Now, how does it actually get from person to person? Well, there's physical contact with the microorganisms or contact. Uh, there's direct contact and indirect contact. So direct contact is uh, somebody um, with the virus touching you or um, you're touching them or you're kissing someone and you come in direct contact with the virus. Indirect is where that person coughs into their hand and then shakes your hand and then you take your hand and touch your eye or nose or face and put the virus onto you. Or that that person rubs their nose and grabs a phone and hands you the phone and then you touch your nose and you have an indirect passage of the virus with some other object as the thing in between the two people. Um, so that occurs with nearly every organism and it does also with this virus. We'll talk about that. Droplet is uh, another charm you'll hear, which is infectious particles and respiratory secretions, which means cough, sneeze, or speech, some liquid that comes out of the mouth, which is part of our respiratory tract. And in order to spread by droplets, you have to have what people call close contact. And this is where the whole stay six feet away from everyone else concept comes from, because if you cough or sneeze, those droplets will travel through the air about six feet. Um, that doesn't mean if you're six foot one inch away, you won't get some dose, but, but uh, just let's imagine this six feet away is how far these droplets spread out of our bodies. The next is called airborne, and this is where infectious particles are suspended in the air for long periods of time. They can go a long distance and then are breathed in. Uh, I mean, uh, these can be like through the air, and um, you can think of... Uh, um, Pollen is airborne. So pollen, not an infection, but another substance that's suspended in the air, and pollen's blown everywhere, and you breathe it in. And so spores are like this for molds. And other, there's a lot of substances that can be airborne. Uh, that's another way to spread infection. And then there are some things that we do. Uh, aerosolize is dispersing of liquid into the air, and in this case, respiratory secretions. So there are ways to aerosolize the virus in this case, and you can also nebulize, or which is called atomize, which is converting liquid into a spray. And so there's devices to, to change liquid into sprays. And these are some things we actually take advantage of in medicine, but that will then create virus particles in the air. So these are all ways you can spread infectious disease. So. Um, how is COVID-19 spread and how can we reduce the spread of it? Well, we can eliminate uh, uh, or reduce direct contacts with the virus by social distancing. If you're not physically touching another person, then you're not going to have direct contact. Um, you can always wash your hands and sanitize your hands so that you're not going to have virus on your own hands. Don't touch your eyes, nose, nose and mouth. And this is where the wear a mask in public uh, concept that the CDC is recommending now, because you then may not let your own mouth secretions directly contact someone else. In healthcare workers, this is why we wear gowns and gloves, is to create a physical barrier between people touching our bodies. And really that means gowns and gloves for healthcare workers. And this is why telemedicine is now popular. Doctors and other healthcare professionals may not want to have to physically touch your body to practice medicine. And so if you do telemedicine, you can still have an interaction with your physician just without the direct contact. And so that is also a way, and that's why you see a lot of physicians of your own offering telemedicine services for the first time. 
indirect contact is that the virus is on something else and then you pick it up and put it inside your body. So this is where the concept of wiping down commonly touched surfaces is. Uh, and there's been some studies that said maybe the virus can live on cardboard for a day. It can live on plastic for a few days and stainless steel for a few days. And so this is where the recommendation to wipe down door handles and sink handles, refrigerator handles, toilet handles, countertops, remotes, phones um, with a bleach solution and easily made one third cup of bleach in a gallon of water or four tablespoons in a quart of water makes a strong enough bleach solution to kill virus particles on surfaces. So this is the indirect contact strategy to stop the spread of not only COVID-19, but uh, nearly every uh, pathogen and microorganism. How do we reduce droplet spread? Well, this is the concept of coughing into your elbow or into a tissue. And then remember, you gotta wash your hands after you start coughing. And also wearing a mask so that if you have a cloth mask on, it limits how much you are spreading the virus to others. And then in healthcare, we wear the N95 mask. It's a designation of 95% uh, of particles, 0.3 microns or larger are blocked by this mask. Uh, and so that's what N95 means. And that's the type of mask we wear to prevent this virus from spread as far as we know. And then we also have to wear eye protection, um, especially in healthcare, because if somebody coughs, it can hit your eye too. And so goggles are better, therefore better than eyeglasses because goggles seal around the eyes, as opposed to eyeglasses, which have room on the sides. And then this is also the concept of self-quarantining if you are ill. So again, if you're coughing, well, then just don't go around other people and you won't spread it by droplets. That's, that's the concept of self-quarantine. Now, it's unclear how much airborne spread contributes to this virus um, because we don't believe it's airborne. But some healthcare thera therapies can make it airborne. That's nebulization or atomization. That's certain uh, aerosolization procedures like putting positive pressure masks on people. Uh, the CPAP mask everyone's familiar with. Well, putting that onto someone's face can then blow air and virus out and around the person and aerosolize the virus and possibly create an airborne contamination. Um, certain types of tubes that we place to help people breathe might aerosolize the virus. And this is the concept behind elective surgery because when you have elective surgery, you, you put on anesthesia machines and that blowing of gas uh, and air into and out of the body uh, through a breathing tube or a mask tube, uh, certain type of mask seal tubes might aerosolize the virus. So that's why elective surgeries are canceled is to not only minimize direct contact, but also any aerosolization and making it airborne. So what do we know about this virus now? Well, as of the CDC website updated as of 1600 hours yesterday, there are, you can see 800,000 plus cases, uh, 44,000 plus deaths. That math is a 5.6% mortality rate, but we really don't know how many cases there are. As far as we know, there could be double or more the number of cases. So, so those are the positive cases and the deaths out of those positive cases. And, and we're really seeing three distinct illnesses which are driving recommendations uh, for us and, and also for, for you. There's this asymptomatic guesstimated about 15% of people. So these are, it's estimated that if you swab people, 15% of them on this nose swab, which is called a nasopharyngeal swab going through the nose to the back of the nose, 50% will have the virus and have no symptoms whatsoever. And you find the virus, I'm just putting in some terms you'll be, you'll be seeing, RT-PCR or PCR, which is polymerase, polymerase chain reaction. That's the way in which you find the virus on the swab. So that's a PCR test. And a positive swab means you harbor the virus, it's in your body, and then you're contagious if you are shedding that virus. So these are all terms you'll see, PCR and shedding. Uh, in nasopharyngeal, 
So, but this is 15% asymptomatic. So how can you be asymptomatic with this virus? Well, either you're in the 14 day incubation period, which is the period after you got your dose of the virus and you have not yet shown symptoms. And because it can take 14 days, you do have the virus and you're contagious, but you don't have no symptoms. So maybe that's why you're asymptomatic, or maybe you truly are asymptomatic. Maybe you have the virus and you have zero symptoms whatsoever. Uh, it could also be that you had COVID-19 and now you feel better. Um, and so now you're asymptomatic, but you still have virus on a swab. And the reason we really don't know the number of cases is because no test is perfect. There's a thing called a false negative which means a negative swab doesn't mean that you don't have the virus, just meant you didn't detect the virus on that swab. So there might not have been enough virus in you, like it might have been your first day out of your 14 day incubation period, so you really didn't have a high viral load, so you won't find it on a swab. Um, or maybe the, just the test was wrong and you have the virus, but the swab said you, do, you, you didn't. And so all these things contribute to this concept of asymptomatic spread, which is a huge challenge when you have such a contagious virus. Most of the disease we're seeing is what we would call mild disease, maybe two thirds of patients. Uh, and these are the people that have fever, cough, tiredness, they know they're not hungry, they don't want to eat anything, they, they ache all over. So that's you know, fatigue, anorexia, myalgia, so tired, don't want to eat and eat. And it, it kind of may be unique. There's a loss of taste and smell in many people. Um, and then some people are really getting diarrhea as much as these other symptoms. And so these are the more common symptoms of mild disease. But these people are, is in our, our opinion, handling the virus pretty well. So what do we do for these folks? We'll self-quarantine, you know, or shelter in place, as people will say. What this means is don't spend time with other people because you're con contagious with whatever you have. Um, call your doctor. They may do a telemedicine visit with you. They may monitor you by telemedicine. And this illness might last a couple weeks and then you feel better or may progress to moderate or severe disease. So moderate disease, which is you know, 12 or so, 10, 12%, higher fevers, your heart races, your oxygen levels go down. When we listen to your lungs, we hear pneumonia, we do a chest x-ray, we see pneumonia in a bunch of different places. We do blood tests, they show a lot of different inflammation markers, and we have to admit you to the hospital for oxygen treatment because your oxygen is low. And then the severe disease is eight or so percent, where eight or so percent severe shortness of breath, people aren't really thinking and speaking normally. We see kidney failure, we see some people having stroke-like symptoms, seizures, even heart attacks. And in severe cases, we have to place a breathing tube to help you breathe and put you on a ventilator. And then you may wind up on the ventilator for two weeks if you survive. And of course, we put you in the intensive care unit. And there are people on the ventilator for two or more weeks while their lungs heal. So that's the span of disease from some that have no idea they have it to others that are dying from it. We have no idea why some people are more or less susceptible. It's not as simple as you're 80 years old with high blood pressure, diabetes, you've had a stroke and you've had a heart attack and now you get the virus and you die because some of those people live and some five-year-old you know, girls die. And so it's not clear why some people have one level of illness and others have another level. Maybe that will be figured out in the future. My suspicion is it has something to do with our genetics, but we're not going to figure that out. So why is this a pandemic? Well, it's a pandemic for a few reasons. First of all, we thought this was going to be just a normal com uh, uh, coronavirus. It's a common cold virus. So maybe it'll be just like common cold and we'll, it'll be spread by contact and by droplets, coughing and sneezing. And so that was the initial guidance, but this is a novel one. So it'll be like MERS and SARS. So if you have fever, cough and fatigue, just you know, stay home. Uh, as long as you're not touching anyone or coughing on anyone, then you're not gonna spread the virus. 
The problem is, is when you try to identify and go back and contact trace and see where did you come in contact with the virus, you couldn't figure it out. Um, and we were seeing community spread nearly immediately. So it, it wasn't as simple as, well, you knew someone or traveled by, someone traveled from China and that's where you caught it. No, it was spread through the community so rapidly, you couldn't contact trace to figure out where you came into contact. And this, it was clear that it was more contagious than can be explained by just being coughed on or sneezing on each other. Plus, we had no testing, so we had no surveillance. We had no idea how many people in our community had this because we didn't have any testing to see how prevalent it was in our society. And then we appreciate now there's a significant asymptomatic spread, so there's no way you can con contact trace if you trace back and people felt fine and had no idea they had the virus, but we're still shedding the virus. So this is really why it's a pandemic. It's a combination of multiple things together. Um, so traditional public health, contact tracing and isolation didn't work. Why is it deadly? Well, again, we thought, oh, this is another novel coronavirus like SARS and MERS. So we're gonna die from lung disease, something called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS which is the severe lung infection where we can't get oxygen in or carbon dioxide out of our bodies and we die because our lungs essentially shut down and stop working. Um, but what we're seeing is nearly every organ in the body is failing in different people. So someone will have just barely a cough but will be in kidney failure or someone else will have ARDS like lung disease other people literally will be having seizures with high fevers, but won't really have much pneumonia and their kidneys are fine. And so there's so much of a variety of disease that the current theory is that something called microangiopathic thrombosis, which means there's clots forming in the little blood vessels in our body. And since every organ has a little blood vessel, if you clot in different blood vessels in different organs, you're gonna have different organs failing. So it's this small blood vessel clotting that is in part the theory behind why we're seeing so many organs failing and it's not all lung disease. Then there's this concept that it's our own body's immune system inflammatory response that's contributing to the illness in some people. And so you might've heard or you'll read something about the cytokine storm. Cytokines, uh, think of those as the inflammation of the immune system. And to a certain extent, cytokines are needed and are good to help kill infections. But if you have a storm, you can imagine that there's just way too much cytokines and that inflammation in the body is causing some harm in some people. So that leads me to talk briefly about treatment. So there's no proven treatments. Supportive care, help people through their illness, but no specific treatment against it. And that is still true today. Now, but because our body's immune system response is contributing to many of the symptoms, it may contribute to the organ damage being seen. There's a lot of medications that are out there already that are used to reduce or modify our immune system. And some people say, just try them. What have we got to lose? Other people say, well, we can harm people. We got to study them. But what's really being happen, happening is in the more severe people, a lot of these medicines are being used and studied simultaneously. And we don't know whether any of these things are gonna help or harm or do nothing. And we won't know until we come through this and have some information because we're using them. So the ones you'll probably hear about is hydroxychloroquine, which is Plaquenil. It's an immunomodulatory agent, meaning it, it changes how your own um, immune system works inside the body and therefore you can reduce some of the inflammation from the immune system so maybe that'll help. Azithromycin or the z pack is an antibiotic uh, and these two medicines were touted early out of China um, but if you mix the two together you can slow and stop the heart and so people can die of an irregular heartbeat and so neither of them are recommended together anymore there was a thought that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, as we uh, call them, most common, we know ibuprofen and naproxen or Advil and Aleve. 
those may have some uh, facilitation of virus replication, so we shouldn't use those. But then the World Health Organization said there's no information that doesn't make any sense. There's corticosteroids, which will reduce your immune system response. The more common ones you may have heard about, prednisone or methylprednisolone. Um, you want your immune system to respond, but not too much. And so maybe there's a place for these, but when they were used in SARS and MERS, they didn't really help your illness, but they let you shed the virus for a much longer period of time. So people were saying, don't use them because we don't want to continue the spread of the virus. And then there's uh, Actemra. I'm not going to, I don't know how to say tocilizumab, but um, this is a, a blocker of inflammation in our body from interleukin-6, IL-6, one of those cytokines you can think of it as. And so this blocks some of the immune system response. This has been touted when you have that cytokine storm, you should take Actemra to reduce that. And then there's the concept of convalescent plasma, which is being discussed more and more nowadays. Um, so convalescent plasma is our immune system generates proteins in our blood called antibodies whenever we come into contact with an infection. And these antibodies show up usually about two weeks or longer after exposure. And so if, if you are infected and you recover and you donate your blood, the blood bank can separate out the plasma that contains these antibodies and then you can transfuse the plasma into an infected person, giving them immunity in theory. So that's the concept behind convalescent plasma. Um, the problem is, is how do you define recovery from this virus? So again, we, we've made a lot of assumptions that have been wrong about this virus. So the original assumption again was, well, as long as you're seven days after your initial fever and you have three more days with no fever, without taking anything like Tylenol or ibuprofen, then you should be fine. But that's not really been the case. So now we've moved to, well, if you've had the virus, you then have to have two negative nasopharyngeal PCR swabs before you can be deemed as no longer contagious, no longer shedding the virus. Um, but again, we're not 100% sure that that's accurate or not. If you have antibodies in your plasma, so say you drew my blood and I had antibodies, well that likely means that I'm immune and I had the virus and didn't know it, but everyone's immunity wanes or decreases over time and we don't know how long any of us are going to stay immune after we have contracted COVID-19. And just because you have antibodies doesn't mean you're not shedding the virus. So there's likely gonna to have to be some multiple negative nose swabs so you don't find the virus in the body and antibodies in your plasma showing that you're immune for the time being. And then you could recovery and therefore donate your plasma to be given to someone else. So how we get from you know this moment right now we're talking to having a system set up to do two negative nasopharyngeal swabs and antibody testing and have blood banks separate and then provide convalescent plasma to people. We haven't even had enough testing to find out who has the virus. I'm not sure how we're ever gonna to get to this point right now. So let's talk about a vaccine. What's a vaccine? It's an immunization. So the term immunization means you generate an immune system response. So we inject a little bit of the infection into your body and you generate an immune system response. You're immunized. That generates the antibodies. And like I was just saying, immunity lasts for a different amount of time for each infection. Measles maybe is lifetime, but other viruses may be a very short period of time. So even if we have a vaccine, we really don't know how long it's going to last. We don't know how often we're going to need a, to be boost, have a booster, um, and we may need a vaccine periodically. And um, I didn't put it on the slide, but it takes typically multiple years to, to generate a vaccine. So even if you try to shortcut it and widespread test it, uh, it's probably a good year to 18 months before a vaccine would be able to be given to people. 
So what do you all do? Same that we talked about from the beginning. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Clean commonly touched surfaces often. Shelter in place. So don't go around and asymptomatically spread the virus to other people. And then when you're in public, wear a mask so that you prevent yourself from expelling more virus out of your body if you're one of these asymptomatic people. And so for that, I just want to say thank you all for doing your part and helping us overcome this <laughs> pandemic. And I want to pass it to uh, Dr. Musburg to give a uh, probably much more interesting take on this virus. Well, thank you. Um, I'm here primarily because I've had this lovely disease and um, I'll give you a short um, timeline of exactly what happened and when. So March 9th evening of a Monday, I got home from a tennis lesson and started feeling worse. And on Tuesday, I went into my office and we canceled my clinic for the next two days, which I've never done. And I felt pretty yucky. I talked to my primary. He thought I probably had the flu, even though I'd had the flu shot. Um, I was taking Advil and, you know, pushing fluids and all the usual stuff, but I was already getting tired. In fact, Tuesday morning, we canceled everybody but two patients. I wore a mask saw them, went home and took a three and a half hour nap um, at noon. Um, by Thursday, I felt a little better. I'd been put on Tamiflu, which is an anti-flu uh, or a flu antiviral. Um, that didn't sit real well with me. And by Friday, we discontinued that. Um, Friday, I felt somewhat better. Saturday, um, about the same, but probably 40 or 50% back to normal. And then Sunday, the 15th, I started feeling worse. And that night, I actually texted my primary care doc and told him how awful I felt. And on Monday, the 16th, I had my first nasopharyngeal swab, um, which took eight days to come back. And it turned out to be positive. But those eight, next eight or nine days were absolutely the worst I've ever felt in my life. I had headaches, terrible sore throat, fevers to 102.6, um, myalgias, muscle aches, nausea, um, absolutely no appetite, and, and just complete and total fatigue. Um, if I walked 30 feet, I had to sit down and rest. If I took a 10-minute shower, I had to take a, literally a three-hour nap. Um, I just, and I felt awful at night. I had weird, scary dreams. Um, and over those eight, nine, 10 days, I lost 20 pounds. The one thing, and I had a cough, but really didn't cough anything up. The one thing I never had, and my primary told me every time he saw me, which was in his parking lot, he would not let me come into his office. He came out to my car and with a mask and goggles and listen to my lungs and swab my nose. And he said, if you get short of breath, go to the ER. Well, I never got short of breath. So I never went to the ER, never got admitted, wasn't in the ICU. But if that's a mild case, I really don't want to have anything more. Empirically, in other words, just because he thought it wasn't a bad idea, by that Friday, he put me on hydroxychloroquine, which is the anti-malaria drug that you hear talking about. It's also called Plaquenil and it's used a lot or at least some for people with rheumatoid arthritis. It's been around for a long time. Um, I was on that for five days. So the following about Tuesday and Wednesday, I started feeling better, not anywhere close to normal, just not as sick as I was. Um, I quit running fevers that Tuesday, which would be the 24th. And by Thursday, we did another swab and Friday, another swab because I have to have two negative swabs 24 hours apart in order to go back to work. Um, the following, again, those took eight days to come back. The following Wednesday, he'd gotten some 
48 hour turnaround swab. So I had another swab. So that Friday I had three results come back and every one of them was still positive. And to kind of cut to the chase in the next three weeks or the last three weeks, I've now had gotten pretty much back to my normal feeling. I've quarantined myself in my house away from my wife since the very first night, which was March 9th. Um, I'm in a back bedroom with its own bathroom and I exit the house in and out through our, through our back porch. So I haven't been in the rest of my house since the 16th of March. Um, and a couple weeks ago, a lady from my church texted me and said she'd heard I had the virus. Would I be willing to see if I could test negative so that I could donate plasma for her husband, who at that point in time had been in the ICU, intubated on the ventilator for nine days. As of tonight, he's now been intubated in the ICU on the ventilator for 28 days. And he's turn the corner enough that they're starting to lessen his sedation. He's probably 70 and pretty healthy. And I will tell you, I mean, I, I'm 63. I take a very small dose of uh, amlodipine for blood pressure. Um, I've never smoked. I'm pretty darn healthy. I used to play. We were running until I hurt my feet. My wife and I are probably playing tennis three to five times a week, which I'm convinced is why my lungs didn't get bad enough. But I have now, as of yesterday, had a total of nine swabs and every one of them is positive. So I am 38 days out from my initial positive swab and I'm still testing positive, even though I've had no symptoms for the last three weeks. So I'm one of those folks that makes the rule of, oh, if you've had you know, 72 hours with no fever and no symptoms, you're fine. Or if you've had 14 days of self-quarantine, you should be able to get out and go around and, and do anything you want. And what I don't know and what nobody knows is if I'm now basically an asymptomatic carrier and I can still go out and infect people and, and we don't know what we don't know. I actually was sent today to get the antibody test and the lab lady said they weren't doing it even though their headquarters in Tampa says they are. So I've got to go back and get more blood drawn tomorrow to see if I've got antibodies. But so the big conundrum really is, you know, on the one hand, in a way you'd like to be positive and then be negative because then you know you had it and you probably have antibodies. On the other hand, if you don't test negative, what does that mean? I mean, I still can't go back to work. My office has been closed for going on six weeks. Um, and so, and both of my office staff got sick. They both tested negative. They now have no symptoms. They're also both female. And so it seems like women maybe don't get as sick as men. Um, the running joke is it's always hormones, but maybe there's something to that. Um, they're also t about 10 and 20 years respectively younger than I am. So that may be part of it as well. Um, but I don't, you know, it, it was the whole self quarantine thing. It isn't fun. It isn't convenient. I mean, you know, I can't hug my wife. I can't hug my son who came home from college. Um, you really are isolated. I mean, I can walk around in my yard, um, but, it's, but it's no fun. And I would like it to end yesterday, but it's, it's the potential for asymptomatic people, as Dave said, infecting folks unbeknownst to them if everybody goes out and starts going to the mall and going to the theater and going to the sporting events and all that stuff, is really a significant risk. I mean, I don't know how I got it. I, I assume I got it from a patient. And it could have been as far back as the first week in February. I mean, the last week in February. But I don't know who. None of them had been to China. None of them had been to Italy. I mean, I talk with my patients and kind of find out what's going on and where they've been. And, and the reality is, 
whoever I got it from could have been an asymptomatic carrier that got it from someone who had traveled there, or they could have gotten it from another asymptomatic carrier. And so, you know, the, nobody knows what the solution is. I mean, there's a ton of people investigating things, trying to find more rapid tests, more accurate tests with less false negatives, antibody tests that are going to tell who's had it and if you've got antibodies. And even then, you, like Dave said, you don't know, do you have lifelong immunity, like if you get the measles vaccine, or is it just going to be coming back year after year and it's like the flu shot and so we can kind of give you vaccines every year and it'll hopefully mitigate it and make it less bad but it's going to be around for a long time so that's that's where i'm coming from um it isn't any fun and and i hope if anybody gets it they get a mild case but i would i would pair it again my my primary who said you know, if you've got shortness of breath, you need to haul, you know what, to the ER as soon as possible. Uh, I've got a brother-in-law who sounded like he might have it. He didn't meet the criteria to be tested. They diagnosed him with pneumonia. He was sick for between two and three weeks till he started feeling better. I've got another relative by marriage who his primary complaint was headaches that just wouldn't go away and, and kind of a sinus infection kind of thing. And he finally turned the corner and is feeling better in a couple of weeks. So it isn't just one symptom or two or some set of things. Um, it can be a variety of stuff. And I mean, I feel for the ER physicians because it's not, you know, as cut and dried as someone who comes in with chest pain and you do some labs and an EKG and maybe they end up getting an angiogram and like, okay, you're either having a heart attack or you're not and you need this or you don't. I mean, it, there's just a huge wide variety of stuff and um, everybody's trying their best, but in a way we're all flying blind. So um, I'm, I'm gonna end there. I'll be happy to answer questions. I know Dave will as well, um, but then I'll turn it over to Joe and he can do his magic with the uh, um, Zoom stuff. <laughs> Well, I'll try my best. It's my first time actually using it. Um, there's 31 of us on here. I mean, from all, from what I'm telling, I think everyone's a brother except for two or three, but I know who they're connected to. So I'm safe to uh, unmute you if you have a question. So if you want to put down in chat that you would like to ask a question, I'll unmute you. So is there any questions? So Evan, Evan Donnellan has a question. Let me find you, Evan. All right, Evan, you should be good. You should be good. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Evan. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Um, so I work on an ambulance, so we see like a pretty moderate amount of corona down here. Uh, my county was the one that made national news for the nursing home, everyone dying. Um, so basically they've started testing people like in, within the fire system and doing the antibody check, but people still aren't really sure like what the advantage is to the whole antibody thing. Cause as you said, you can still be an asymptomatic carrier. So like, what are they really hoping to gain from, um, I mean, obviously they can tell if I have it, then I shouldn't be working. But other than that, like, what is the real benefit of knowing who has the antibodies because it might not necessarily mean that I could survive it or whatnot. I'll start. The having antibodies is important, which means you're probably not going to get ill from it while you have antibodies. So even if you are surrounded by the virus, you personally will be fine. You will not get sick again. And so that doesn't mean you don't have it and you can't spread it to other people, but it means you won't get sick. So people are talking about antibodies as a way of identifying workers who can go back to work because they're not gonna get sick from other people, but the other side of the equation isn't true. You could make someone else sick. So I, I believe it's gonna to have to be a combination of a reliable test that says you are not shedding virus and gonna make other people sick and you've had this, you're not gonna get sick 
then you're going to be okay engaging in society again. I think that's where the value of antibody testing is, personally. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, next person is Corey. Corey, uh, sorry if I uh, destroy your last name. I have a habit of muting uh, <laughs> people's last names, those who know me. But uh, Corey Klesat. Hi, good evening. Uh, this is Corey Claystat. Uh, thank you for, first of all, for, for having this tonight and for speaking. Um, my question is uh, regarding the, the news reports in the past week about COVID toes. And I was wondering whether either of you have uh, encountered that um, or heard of any adults having it. Um, there have been a lot, the reports have been talking about kids in Europe having it. Um, but I was wondering if, if you've heard of adults having it. It, it. For those of you who haven't read the article, it has to do with the, um, the, the uh, small capillaries uh, in your feet um, and uh, basically displaying like a chicken pox kind of rash. I have not heard of that. Um, I had not seen those reports. And on the lighter side, we usually take off people's socks in the ER. You can imagine why. <laughs> um, I, I can definitely say that even though we jokingly say that ENT stands for ears, nose, and toes, um, I only had one lady come in the, 20 years ago that wanted me to look at her bunions um, and didn't think that the joke was funny. I have not read the article. I have not heard of it. Um, I can tell you that I did not get a rash on my toes. I haven't heard of anybody of my colleagues who have called me to check on me mentioning anything about it. Um, but I am obviously out of the loop because I'm not at the hospital or at my office to talk with anybody about it. So just as a quick follow up, um, for, for people who possibly had that as their symptom and it goes away in a couple of days. Um, there's the possibility that they could have antibodies. Um, how, how quickly, at least I'm, I'm from New Jersey, uh, are the antibody tests going to become available uh, to the masses? I don't know. I'm, I heard that they're just starting to roll them out. So my guess would be it'll be weeks and maybe months before they're readily available to anyone and everyone just to test to find out. And, and honestly, I would say it is if it's if you're talking about, you know, available to millions of people. I would say the answer is definitely months, um, just because I don't think they can gear things up that fast. They haven't geared up testing to see if you're positive. I mean, it's faster now than it used to be and the turnaround time is faster. But again, part of the problem apparently is getting the reagents that it takes to run the test. And you just can't throw tens and hundreds of thousands and millions of tests at a finite number of labs and say, oh yeah, we can, you know, give everybody results in 72 hours like they do on, you know, do DNA tests on NCIS or something. I mean, it just, it, it just isn't going to happen. Um, weeks, weeks before you have enough labs to penetrate anywhere in the country and then months until you have like more widespread testing across the country for antibodies. The next question comes from Largen. He's connecting to audio right now. Are you there? Or do you just want to, you just want to text your question? All right, so let's go to Biology 95, if you can let us know um, your name and what chapter you're from.
Um, hello, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, my name is Amanesh. I'm from the Alpha Alpha chapter in Pennsylvania. Well, I'm an, I'm an alum now. So um, I live in Pittsburgh and I work in a microbiology lab. It's like very close to a hospital. And like, I'm just worried, like other than like the face masks they like make us wear and like gloves and other things, like what else do I need to worry about? Like in terms of like surfaces when I'm like leaving work or like coming into work, like how long does like the virus like last on like surfaces like doors and stuff? One of the reports I had seen is that it can last three to four days on stainless steel. And so therefore, if you have door handles or um, turnstiles, I guess for that matter, or anything else that's steel, like even I guess you can imagine some door handles and refrigerator handles and sinks and toilets, three to four days it can last. And so I would hope that every workplace has instituted a frequent wipe down of commonly touched surfaces. Right. Uh, but I wouldn't, of course, trust that. So if, if you have, you know, can carry your own bleach wipes, uh, then you're going to want to wipe down everything uh, that's commonly touched with a, with a bleach wipe. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I've been doing anyway. I have like those like small, like the lens cleaner wipes for your glasses with like the alcohol on it. That's what I've been using right now. If there's something that's 10% bleach or 60% alcohol, those are the numbers of the percentages of those uh, substances that are killed, that kill microorganisms. So um, I don't know if a lens wipe has enough chemical in it, but um, a, a bleach wipe or a 60% alcohol solution would be able to kill surfaces. So uh, viruses and other microorganisms on surfaces. If you work in a micro lab, I might suggest grabbing a pair of disposable gloves and wearing them all the way home and then throwing them out and having another pair in your pocket and wearing them all the way back. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're kind of limiting like how much PPE we're like allowed to like use. So like other than like lab work, like we're not allowed to take like extra PPE out of the lab with us. Well, I know they sell, you know, like gloves that um, the folks wear that work in cafeterias and places like that. I mean, I would think any barrier glove would keep you, you know, especially in, in something disposable. Um, you know, you might be able to find them in a, I don't know, grocery store or a pharmacy or whatever. And just, you know, a pair going home and a pair going back to work and, and, you know, suck up the cost yourself if you can find them. I, I like, again, since I can't go out to stores, I have no idea the availability of this stuff. But, um, I mean, that's, that would be my suggestion to see if it's available and, and you know, wear disposable gloves. So the next question comes from Gene Spencer. Um, he put it down in the chat. I don't know if you can see it, Dave or David. It says, um, he was surprised to see one slide mention the need to reduce or modify the immune system and that he assumes that a strong immune system would be an advantage. Yeah, this is one of the interesting aspects of this virus is that there are, there are other illnesses where our own immune system inflammatory reaction contributes to the illness. And in some people, um, this is felt to be a significant contributor to the severity of their illness. And so you'll see in here maybe uh, the cytokine storm, which means there's just too much immune system response. Uh, and that is contributing to the severity of illness. And that's when um, some people are recommending steroids and this uh, interleukin-6 inhibitor called Ectemra to try and reduce the overactive immune system. So c consider it a, a pendulum going too far uh, to uh, too strong of an immune system actually causing harm. Uh, that's, that's what that slide and that concept is. Um, next question, um, Largent has fixed his audio issue, so I'll let him, we'll jump back and let him ask his question. Go ahead. Um, 
Leave it on. Then he fixed it. Hold on. Try it now. Can you hear Just to confirm, you'd like to FaceTime Tyler Holland? Um, why don't you text your question and then we can ask it that way. Um, so let's go to Bob Saltzman. You have a question? You need to unmute yourself, Bob. You're talking, but can't hear you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm from Beta Chapter. Uh, first of all, guys, thank you. This has been great and very helpful. Uh, I live in Massachusetts where stores are now prohibiting us from using personal tote bags. Ironically, after getting rid of them for environmental reasons, the stores now are bringing back plastic bags. You had said earlier that germs last on plastic for days. Does that include these plastic bags that the supermarket's making us use? In theory, yes, but the virus would have to be put onto that plastic bag. Mm. So that would be like one of those indirect contact things where someone who is shedding the virus would have to put it onto the plastic bag and then you would touch it and then touch your eye, nose, or mouth and indirect contact spread it to yourself. So that means that within the, if three or four days is accurate, within three or four days before you touched it, someone else would have had to put virus on it. And so that's the, how that could happen. Yeah. Yes, if you're bringing in your own contaminated tote bag, um, then- yeah, that's, that's not, yeah. Yeah, then you could be sharing your contaminated tote bag with others in the store. Maybe that's the reason, uh, but I, um, I'm not sure if that's real or practical, uh, but that's, I mean, that's not happening where I am in Northern New Jersey, so. Yeah, Massachusetts loves making laws and it's just ironic that after telling us all to get rid of the plastic bags, now that they're telling us we, they had to dig them up again. <laughs> yeah, very ironic. So, Large, um, he texted a question. It's how can the ease of transmissibility be explained other than it being airborne? Assuming it's airborne, how are cloth masks effective? Yeah, so, if it's airborne, cloth masks aren't really effective because it's suspended in the air. Uh, people would have to be wearing a mask 100% of the time to not put any virus into the air. Um, the ease of transmiss I think the ease of transmissibility is because there's asymptomatic spread, meaning I think it's much more than 15% of us are asymptomatic. I, I mean, there's even some people that guess maybe 50% of infections are asymptomatic. If that's the case, then we have more than 800,000 plus. We have now 1.6 million plus in, in the U.S. I think it's asymptomatic uh, people are spreading the virus. I think that's why it's so um, easily spread. I am praying it's not airborne because if it is, then, but I mean, if it is, then we all should have it, right? And, and it, there's, there's only 1% of the population in my state with the virus and we're as tested, right? So positive tests are 1% of our population in New Jersey. That's not, that means 99% of the people if the tests are accurate, they don't have symptoms, they don't have it. So I think it's asymptomatic spread, personally. Here's a follow-up question saying, aren't hospitals putting positive cases in AIRS? Don't know what that means. Airborne isolation rooms? Uh, pressure rooms? Uh, no. Contact and droplet precautions. Okay. Yeah, there aren't that many of those rooms in hospitals. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the point. And then, yeah. yeah, we have 24 bed units, I think, and um, three units in my hospital are all COVID units now. And our ICU, of course, is all intubated COVID and all holding intubated in the ER. And I think we only have a half a dozen, maybe a dozen negative pressure rooms. So if we have 100 beds and, and 90 COVID patients in the hospital or 100 if we're full, everyone cannot be in a negative pressure. Um, Dan LaPlaca has a question. He says he's heard that 
the virus sometimes mutates. Any, any evidence of that occurring with COVID-19? I suspect it's too early to tell. And um, I mean, there may, since there's, there may be multiple strains out there already, which is why some people get sicker than others and some take longer to recover than others. And if it's like, you know, in this respect, the flu virus, it mutates every year to a small degree and about every five years to a more major degree. And there have been some articles out there about, you know, gloom and doom scenarios that this thing's going to mutate and get even worse. And the next time it comes around, it's going to kill, you know, 10 times as many people or whatever. And so we might as well all give up. But the thing about mutations that people need to understand is it could mute, it could mutate and become more infectious and more deadly. And it could mutate and get a whole lot less infectious to be where it's virtually not infectious. I mean, there's no way to tell. Um, and that's going to be something that we find out as the months and, and years go by. There isn't any way to tell now. I mean, it could be mutating now. Um, I don't know that anybody has put out any data about that. Um, the virology folks are probably trying to track that. But in terms of the clinical significance right now, I think everybody's focused on trying to treat the people that are sick as, you know, really sick now. So um, Amnesh has a follow-up question. And he had, he asked, some viruses like the common cold and flu spread more when the weather is colder. Is that possibly with COVID? Yes, it is a possibility. Maybe that's why it first was found in the cold months, November through now. Um, we're hopeful, but I'm not sure we know enough about this virus. And, you know, to, to Largen's point, maybe there is some airborne spread. And then if something's airborne, then it doesn't necessarily matter what season you're in. Um, but if it is more contact and droplet, then those are more common during the winter months in terms of transmissibility. So I think um, everybody's hope in the beginning was it was a cold weather thing because, you know, mm -hmm. if you look at the map latitude wise in the, you know, in the early time in China and Italy and all these places are, are farther Northern climates. But now when you look at Dave's map, I mean, it's, it's in South America and Africa and it's summertime there or going into fall. And it isn't like it hasn't hit Florida and Arizona and Texas and Louisiana. And it, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we were in the nineties every day. So it, it didn't shut it down here. Um, Hall Jones um, has a question. Hall, do you want to ask it? Yeah, I was just, uh, you know, as we're looking at, uh, you know, states starting to open up or when we start thinking about the fall, whether some uh, universities are going to, uh, you know, open up and have students come, you know, how should we think about advising, uh, you know, the active members how to conduct themselves? You know, is there anything in particular outside of what was already in the presentation about social distancing, washing your hands, masks, et cetera, that we should be thinking about? That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm hopeful that we're going to have a little more information in the next few months and that we will start to see some knowledge gained from antibody testing to see how many people are immune. Um, if we can have quick uh, qualitative yes or no tests that are 15 minute turnaround and those can be mass produced uh, and not require certain swabs and certain reagents and certain machines that you can only put a hundred swabs on at a time and it takes you know an hour or two hours or three hours to run a test if there's like a really quick easily distributed test then we're really going to understand who in our society has the virus and is 
contagious. As long as those are reliable tests, we'll know who's contagious and hopefully start to know who's immune. And if that's the case, then I think we'll have some better guidance come the fall. Um, but if, I mean, if, if we'll just have to all wait and see how, what we learn in the next couple months. So there's one other question on Rose's question about warmer weather and effects on the disease. But, but uh, Largen asks whether airborne or symptomatic mass improper use of PPE contribute to spread. I'm not sure what improper use means, but. Wearing gloves and masks. Not sure. Largy, can you chat, um, answer uh, Dave's question of what you mean by improper use? He says, touching on masks, not removing properly without cross contamination. Yeah, so it's indirect, indirect contact spread. Yeah, so if there's a virus on the surface of your mask or on the surface of your goggles and you touch the outside and then touch something else and somebody else picks up that virus and touches their body, that's how it can be spread. Yeah, so there's a whole uh, 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 approach to how you, as we call don and doff or put on or take off our PPE so that in theory, you're not touching the part of your body that would have had direct contact with the virus. And so you, you take your masks off from behind, you take your goggles off from behind, you take your gloves off, you don't pull the gloves off like this, you, take, you peel the gloves off from the inside and then you fold them together and then you wash your hands and, and you, you remove everything away from your body into a receptacle. Um, that's, if, right. if it is airborne, yeah, and you shake your mask or you, you, know, you fluff off your glasses or you shake your gown off, well, then you're just spreading the virus into the air. Um, we hope that's not the case. So there is some approach to how you put on and take off your protective environment and your PPE in the healthcare system. Are there any other questions um, that you have? Um, anyone, we're at the top, a little, pa little past top of the hour. Uh, Evan, you see you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, thanks again for having this and thank you for your time. Uh, I just wanted to ask again, I know you mentioned, or um, I know you mentioned about like nebulizing and um, how that can kind of bring the virus into the air. So, um, there's some people that like smoke in the courtyard of the building I live in and just like, is that kind of the same thing? Is that the same process? Like there's a lot of people smoke in Richmond and that's kind of in the air rather, rather frequently. So is that considered like real contamination? Uh, I mean, sure. But D David, you want to comment on that? You might. Well, I would think that, I mean, obviously you're not smoking and wearing a mask. And so the potential of putting more virus into the air every time you exhale when you're smoking cigarettes, I would think, yeah, increases the risk. I mean, I think that's why, you know, personally, ENT docs like myself are at markedly increased risk because we're face to face and we're looking in people's noses and mouths all the time and they're breathing right on us. Um, I don't think when slash if I go back to practice, I mean, I think we'll probably be wearing masks from now on every patient, every time forever, and maybe masks and eye shields kind of stuff. Um, so in, in, the smoking thing, I mean, obviously we know it's bad, but I would, um, you know, since we're close to the end of this, my, my plea to people honestly would be, especially to the younger folks that are between, you know, the, the college fraternity members all the way up. I mean, 
really lifelong, but especially into your 40s and maybe up to 50. I mean, the hap- it's clear that in this disease, this infection, the older folks with the chronic medical illnesses fare by far worse. Now, they are at increased risk for more complications from just general pneumonia and the flu and surgeries in general. But in this case, it's even, I think, more so because we don't know how to mitigate it. And so the health habits that everyone has between 18 and 50 are the things, you know, that are going to pay dividends or put you at marked increased risk of a bad outcome, morbidities and mortality in the, in the things that you get in your 60s, 70s and 80s. And so, you know, smoking is bad and being overweight is bad and not exercising is bad. And, and those decisions that you make for those decades of your 20s, 30s and 40s are going to come home to roost when you're in your 60s, 70s, and 80s. And if you need to change your lifestyle, if this thing doesn't show you that you need to, then nothing will. Because, and if it does, then you need to start doing things now. I'm not seeing any more questions. So, you know, I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening and hearing Dave and Dave talk. Um, this is part of our, our new series and our philosophy from an educational standpoint of the fraternity for both undergrads and, and alums, uh, looking at it as a brother's keeper model from three columns of health and wellness, executive skills, and, and leadership. And obviously, this comes under health and wellness. And Dave and, and David, thank you so much for giving some of your time. And, and I know you're real busy. One, you know, from COVID and David. Case and Dave taking care of everyone in the emergency room. So I really appreciate that. Um, our next program will be May 20th at 9 p.m. And Brother Scott Ryan, he's from the Ada chapter. Um, he's a physical therapist and he's going to discuss what we can do at home in way of physical exercise to keep ourselves moving without having access to a gym. Um, so with that being said, I hope to see you in May. If you have any suggestions, please feel free to email me at jrosenberg at kdr.com. And uh, good night and God bless and honor Super Omnia, brothers. Thanks, Big Joe. Thank, Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.